I should just say then briefly that the Book of Changes is thought to be the oldest of the great Chinese classics and to date from perhaps as early as 1300 BC. Although perhaps the figures of which this classic is a discussion may be much earlier than that, they may go back to the earliest phases of human thought because the I Ching really is the ground plan of the way in which the Chinese think and not only the Chinese. It's almost a mapping of the thinking processes of man. And it may surprise you to know that the system of arithmetic, which is used by digital computers, came from the I Ching. We have a binary system of arithmetic in which all numbers may be represented by zero and one in various arrangements. Is you is or is you ain't? The solution of the problem of life is seen in the vanishing of this problem. Is not this the reason why men to whom after long doubting the sense of life became clear could not then say wherein this sense consisted? There is indeed the inexpressible. This shows itself. It is the mystical. The right method of philosophy would be this to say nothing except what can be said, i.e. the propositions of natural science, i.e. something that has nothing to do with philosophy. And then always, when someone else wished to say something metaphysical, to demonstrate to him that he had given no meaning to certain signs in his propositions. This method would be unsatisfying to the other, he would not have the feeling that we were teaching him philosophy, but it would be the only strictly correct method. My propositions are elucidatory in this way. He who understands me finally recognizes them as senseless when he has climbed out through them, on them, over them. He must, so to speak, throw away the ladder after he has climbed up on it. He must surmount these propositions. Then he sees the world rightly. Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Now, you know, those people you've just been listening to, chanting the sutras on Koyasan, which is the sort of ultimate uh, center, retreat, inner sanctuary of Japanese practice of Vajrayana, Mahayana Buddhism, are a bunch of boys who are just like uh, American college boys who play football, and um, they haven't the faintest idea what they're doing. Not today. They're doing this because their fathers have sent them there. Their fathers own temples, and they've got to carry on their father's tradition, because after all, the family business has to go on. And they have no more idea what this is all about than the man in the moon. And you and I can sit here, and we could get swinging with this music, we could dance to it, and we could go very far out on it, which was what you were originally supposed to do. And for them, it's a chore. It's a thing you have to get up for at five o'clock in the morning, and uh, you have to memorize all this, and you have to get it exactly right and do it. And they've completely forgotten what it was all about. But it was originally there. It's a funny thing how this happens, you see. 
But do you see how I was explaining to you this morning? How we have a rhythm between remembering and not remembering. You remember long enough to know that you're there. Because if you don't remember, nothing makes any impression upon you. Therefore, you're not there. But then when memory gets too much and you're too much there, then you have to realize that all memory is an illusion, that there is nothing except the present moment. And that there is no future, as equally no past. And then you're liberated. But when you get liberated, you have to come back in and, and play memory again. There's a cleaning process. In other words, you wipe off the blackboard and then uh, you start writing again. And then you wipe it off and then you start writing again. And this is the process whereby life is kept going. So in the same way with these people. They have come to a point in the historical development of their uh, way of life where they remember too much. It's not new to them. And all this therefore becomes what we call going through the motions. And so this is the same paradox that I was talking about this morning that... Um, The echo, which is memory, is simultaneously what tells you you exist and what traps you. So in the sense that it tells you you exist, it's an advantage. To the extent that it traps you, it's a debt. You're in debt. You should be thankful. Somebody gave it to you. Ultimately, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the Lord God did it all for you, and you should be thankful and say, anything bad that I did was from me. Dear God, anything good that I did was from you. You see? What a marvelous mix-up that is. But all I'm saying is this. There is a point in 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 all this development where you have to say to people please come off it in other words these boys here in Koyasan I was aching to know enough Japanese to say to them do you realize what a great thing you have here couldn't you possibly enjoy it for a few minutes and let's get together and all join hands around here and go through this again, these sutras, and really make it. So I'm talking, you see, about the same process of what has been called flip-flop ability, whereby we switch from one attitude to another, one situation to another, and this pulse switch situation is the very nature of existence. That's why your heart does that. That's why all sounds, all light, everything is going bloop, 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 bloop. All I know is that first you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Various institutions do not exist for the good of the public but for their own interests. And that when you prohibit something by law, you automatically sweep it under the carpet or drive it underground, where it festers and gets worse and worse and worse. Everything needs to be brought out into the open to have the sunlight on it.